Hey, what is up guys? David Zhao here and today we're gonna have to debunk my previous assertion about how the 85mm G Master is the portrait king. That's because today we're talking about the incredible portrait lens and bulky beast that is the Sony 135mm f1.8 G Master lens. As usual, if you're interested in this lens or any of the gear I talk about or use to make these videos, links to them will be in the description down below. For those of you who use the affiliate links, thank you so much as that's how this channel is supported. Also, if you want to jump around the sections, timestamps are in the pinned comments down below as well. Okay, let's start with the build quality of this lens. We're quite familiar with the G Master build quality by now. We're looking at a full metal construction combined with an excellent, huge glass element, which brings the weight of this bad boy to 950 grams. That's 130 grams more than the Sony 85mm f1.4 G Master lens. Here's a side by side in terms of the size difference between the two lenses as well. With professionals in mind, functionality seems like Sony's key focus of this build quality. We've got a gamut of physical function buttons, a manual focus, autofocus switch, a three-stage focus limiter, a, uh, no, not one, two programmable buttons, and a click declick switch for the aperture ring. Speaking of which, of course, not only do we have a focus ring, we also have an aperture ring on this lens. And as Sony has done with all of their GM lenses, they've added a admittedly thin rubber gasket, which doesn't weatherproof the lens connection point, but it does make it dust and moisture resistant. On that note, actually, I'm quite happy to say I just finished a photo shoot where it kind of downpoured on us, but I was still able to get some great shots in the rain for a short period of time, and the camera and lens are both a-okay. So build quality is always good. Sony always does a good job. But now let's talk about the image quality. Image wide sharpness from centers to corners all yield impressive results, albeit corners are a little soft when you have the lens wide open at like f1.8. But if you look at the center at f1.8, you have some seriously tack sharp centers and the corners are honestly good enough considering you'll probably be using this for portrait use and therefore the focus is usually on the center. But of course, as you start stopping down the lens, the image just keeps getting sharper, going from f1.8 to 2.8 to f4 to f8, all the way up to 16 and 22, this lens definitely deserves the title of one of the sharpest Sony lenses I have ever tested. Aberrations that usually result from wide apertures like chromatic aberration are really well controlled. While they do exist at some level, notably in the corners when wide open, I found it really difficult to produce all that much fringing in actual use. And while we're talking about artifacts, one of those would be lens flares. And personally, I find the flaring to be quite controlled thanks to the nano AR coating Sony has applied to the glass elements as they do for all of their GM lenses. But even when the lens does flare, it does so in a subtle bloom, which I find to be both clean and cinematic at the same time. If you get it at a certain angle, you also get this soft rainbow. Unlike the Sigma 56 I previously talked about how I didn't like the rainbow band across the, the image, it wasn't because it was a rainbow band, but rather because it was such a hard edged, saturated uh, lens flare. Of course, this can be controlled with the use of a lens hood, which will limit that uh, lens flare if that's not what you're looking for in the image you're trying to take. Next up, you know it, of course we have to talk about it, at f1.8, bokeh, or the quality of the out of focus area is what I really wanted to focus on in this review of this lens. With 11 rounded aperture blades, a shallow f1.8 aperture, and compression from a tight focal length like 135 millimeters, you get some insane bokeh. Everything from how much it isolates a subject to how creamy the background looks, I was absolutely in love with shooting at f1.8. For a little bit, I honestly forgot what the background even looked like where I was shooting. And that's because the bokeh rendering just absolutely turns it into a milky, milky, just blurred, beautiful mess. 
Now I know for some people this isn't their preferred look since you lose a sense of place. But if your goal is to place your tack sharp subject in a creamy, bokehlicious background, this lens can do it. If your goal is not to do that, well then that's fine. When I was getting some video clips out in the harsh sun, I decided to drop the f-stop down to f4 or f8, and I still had great subject isolation thanks to the compression of the focal length, but still was able to show the background for context of where everything was. Autofocus on this lens is also super fast, something we've come to expect from native Sony lenses. During the time I had to test this lens, I didn't have any issues with autofocus speed or accuracy. I was able to track subjects moving away from the lens as well as towards the lens. I will note that I did notice while I was using the lens that the autofocus motors do make audible noise and it isn't dead silent. But in practice, I don't think the noise will make it into your audio files unless you're pointing a microphone directly at your lens. It's just one of those things that you can hear if you're in a dead silent room. Now, one final note loosely regarding image quality. This lens is capable of a minimal focusing distance of about 2.3 feet or 70 centimeters. Now, this isn't the one feet requirement of, of getting you macro photography, but because it's 135 millimeter focal length, this gets you really close to your subjects. So while it isn't a macro lens, you can get some pseudo macro shots from it, something that you couldn't do with the Sony 85 millimeter lens lens. Just food for thought. So what's my conclusion about this lens? I mean, this lens comes in at $2,098 brand new, an even heftier price tag than even the $1,799 price tag for the Sony 85mm G Master. However, as I've worked on more and more professional jobs as a photographer, I've started to understand the price point. This lens can become your bread and butter portrait lens that you use for hundreds if not thousands of times every year. If you break that down into a, like a per shoot cost, it becomes pretty reasonable. As one other reviewer described this lens, it truly is the working man's lens or the professional's tool because it gets the job done and it gets it done really, really well every single time. This lens is definitely for professionals or those who want to become professionals in the portraiture field. While yes, of course, you could use this lens for other use cases, like being a pseudo fake macro lens. Its true specialty lies in taking sharp, breathtaking portraits and being able to isolate uh, your subjects in a creamy background of bokeh. Why is it for professionals? because it comes with features that make your day-to-day -day life as a portrait photographer easier. From accessibility, thanks to the myriad of physical controls, to providing you with flexibility, knowing that your entire aperture range is sharp and usable and gives you creative freedom over that range. But what if you're a casual portrait photographer? If that's you and you don't plan on becoming a professional portrait photographer, I personally don't think you need this lens. It's just too expensive for a hobbyist. And while it does deliver the sharpest photos I've ever laid my eyes upon, that doesn't make other cheaper lenses less sharp than they are. Like take for example, the very well-made Sony 85 millimeter F 1.8, which comes in at $598. It's known to shoot sharp images with good looking bokeh, but comes in at almost a quarter of the price of this lens. If you're a hobbyist, the 85mm f1.8 is probably all you'll ever need and you could take that extra $1,500 difference to invest in other things to explore your hobby. Whether that's a camera body, other lenses, lighting, backdrops, etc. But I will say, personally, this is definitely a lens I plan on picking up and keeping sooner rather than later. While it functions in a similar role to my 85mm G Master, it just does something so much better than the 85mm. That subject isolation and the extra sharpness really shows in the photos I've been taking with it for the past two weeks. And it's one of the few lenses that make me just go, while I'm taking photos with it and when I put it on my computer and I'm editing. If you're a professional portrait photographer, whether you do portraitures, headshots, family photos, or weddings, I highly recommend this lens. 
It's definitely an expensive investment, but it's definitely a worthwhile investment that will last you your entire career in the full frame E-mount system. And again, if you're interested in checking out this lens or any of the equipment used to make these videos, don't forget, check out the link in the description down below. All right, that's it for this one. Thumbs up if you enjoyed the video or found it to be helpful. Subscribe and ring that notification bell for more content just like this. And let me know in the comment section down below what you think about this lens. Do you think it's worth the money? Do you think it's absurdly expensive? What did you think of the footage and photos I showed you guys from the lens? Is it just as sharp as I'm describing it or no? Let me know, I wanna know your thoughts down below. And as always, I will see you guys in the next video.